Uh, let us uh, attend to our scriptures. It's uh, Revelation uh, chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white? And where have they come from? I said to them, sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And for this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, for the gift of this day, we give you thanks, and we come before you, and we ask your Holy Spirit to come, to come and be ever-present with us, leading the meditations in our hearts and minds. May they be acceptable in your sight. So come, Holy Spirit, come as we prepare our lives to come to the table of grace that we might go forth from this place graceful and grace-filled. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen. Several years ago, I went with one of our former bishops, Bishop Young Jin Cho, to Seoul, Korea. And the reason for the trip was so that we could be introduced to uh, their prior prayer practices, in particular, their early morning prayer Uh, which was not just a few church leaders would get together, but the entire congregation uh, would gather at 5 o'clock in the morning. Yes, 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Every, not just every once in a while, but every single day. We were told, you better be there by 5 o'clock in the morning. And we were, and we we shared in that time of prayer. And it certainly was very impactful to see so many people worshiping and praying, praying in that way. But one of the most eye-opening events for me occurred not in that sanctuary with so many people praying, though that was impactful. One of the most captivating experiences for me was not in the cozy confines of the sanctuary, but out in a cold, and I mean cold, cemetery. On one rainy afternoon, the kind of rain that doesn't, an umbrella does no good. You've experienced that kind of rain before. Why are you even holding the umbrella? Because the rain is coming in sideways. It was that kind of wind blowing the rain everywhere. We had traveled 7,000 miles to visit several places in Seoul, Korea, and rain or shine, we were going to go through that cemetery that rainy morning. We weren't given an out. And so there I was with several Virginia clergy walking in the pouring rain through the Yangwajin Foreign Missionary Cemetery. See, it wasn't just any cemetery. It was the Foreign Mission Cemetery. And the docents who were expecting us to come, they did not give us a choice. They threw an umbrella at us and said, let's go. We wanted to stay on the church bus or at least bypass the cemetery. Oh, we can see it from afar. Can we just go into the building and wait for lunch? No, we were given an umbrella into our hand and off we went walking through the puddles of that cemetery. See, they didn't want the delegation from Virginia to go all the way to Seoul, Korea without going through what they saw and experienced and knew to be hallowed grounds because it was a very sacred, holy place for them. While we walked through the cemetery, I became familiar with the last names of Widdowson and Holbert, Underwood and Appenzeller. See, in that sacred place, 
with the lots of tombstones that were there, more than the 145 grave sites that we visited, but 145 grave sites of Christian missionaries and their families that had bought, brought the gospel to the Korean Peninsula. They had come to share the gospel. They had come to set up medical practices. They had come to set up orphanages and to start schools. They gave up life in America, not for a week or two or a few weeks. They gave up their life and they set up a new life in Korea so that they could share the gospel with those who have never heard it before. And I, I wondered, why would they do such a thing? What would, what would invite someone from America to go and, and live there and share the gospel in that way? And certainly, I imagine it has to start with a love for God. And so it was a love for God, and that's why they're there. I think it also had to do with sharing the gospel message with others. And certainly having a love for people, a love for others. And it must have also had to do with this stronghold, this call that they experienced from God to, to go a halfway around the world to share the good news in word, sign, and deed. You know, those early missionaries, they were living out what we hear in Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when, he comes, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the, all the ends of the earth. And so while we were there with rain coming at us from all directions, we heard the stories. We heard the story of, of Dr. Heron who gave up his medical practice moved halfway across the world, set up shop in Seoul, Korea, there for a few years, and then died of a disease. We heard story after story of several missionaries who remained in Seoul, Korea, even though they witnessed the death of a spouse or the death of children. They stayed because of a great sense of call to offer the gospel to those who had yet to hear. These missionaries, like the saints in the Revelation passage, had come through the great ordeal, their robes white, washed in the blood of the Lamb. See, in Jesus' disease and sacrifice and death, they're all swallowed up in the victory that is won. These missionaries, they were, they were Methodist they were Presbyterians. They were people from the Salvation Army. And they had all come with the same intentions of sharing the gospel with those who have yet to hear. And so there in the pouring rain, the docent took us from one headstone to the next and she told their stories. She brought those stories to life. They remember the saints very well. Those first missionaries arrived over 130 years ago and they know their names like they know the names of the people that they worship with on Sunday morning. They know the saints, those that have gone before them and those who are with them yet even now. In that sanctuary of Bupyong Methodist Church, the host church for our seven days there, there were, there were these two large banners. And on the, on the right banner, there was an, an image of John Wesley. And I really wasn't surprised to see that. It was a Methodist church. So there's this image of John Wesley. And then there's a quote that I've heard many times before, all the world is my parish. And that quote comes when John Wesley was barred from preaching in the established church because of his radical ways and his new methods of doing doing church. So I was pleased but not surprised to see that kind of banner in that Korean Methodist church that can trace its roots to Methodist movement like we can trace our roots to that Methodist movement of the 18th century. But on the left hand side was a, a picture of the first Methodist missionary, A.P. Appenzeller. There's that last name again. So the reverence for the saints wasn't reserved for the docents of the cemetery and the museums who were asked their tasks with remembering the names and telling their stories. But the name was before all who gathered to worship in that Methodist church. Just as there was a quote from Wesley, there was a quote from Appenzella, bring light and liberty 
to Korea. And so I learned and experienced a great deal during my time in South Korea, but this remembering the saints made an impression on me. And as I think about all saints every year, I think, yes, about my beginnings. I think about those who shared their faith with me. I think about my home church in Farmville. I think about the churches that I sung in, the churches that helped shape who I am. I, I give thanks to God for the, the churches I've been blessed to serve along the way. I give thanks to God for the blessings of, of this church as we're able to share Christ's love here in this place and live out our faith. And so, yes, on All Saints Day, there's a lot of reflecting going on. And, but I also remember that time in Seoul, Korea. And that, and the intention and the care by which the church remembered the saints. It wasn't just reciting the names or telling the stories in the cemetery or seeing the banners on display in the sanctuary that was impressive, although that was impressive. Rather, over and over again, we heard from our hosts throughout the week how the, the gospel of Jesus Christ had come to Korea because of American Christian missionaries who had set out on an incredible journey to take the gospel to them. And as we went from church to church, we were showered with love and gratitude because in their eyes, we were the ones that had brought the gospel to them. As an American Christian, I was receiving radical hospitality and signs of gratitude because I represented those who had gone before me 130 years ago. And they were showering us with gifts everywhere we went. We received something, and one of those somethings is this cross that I wear each and every Sunday. And as an American... I was receiving heartfelt signs of appreciation because not only had we bought the gospel some 130 years ago, we had shown up in great military number to protect them during the Korean conflict and have been there ever since. Such sacrifices, for many the ultimate sacrifice, were made by hundreds of people who had gone before me. And I was simply there some 60 years later and I'm receiving such acts of gratitude and appreciation they remembered. There were 30 of us on that trip learning firsthand about the, the deep sense of prayer that guided that church. Uh, hundreds of people, and I'm not, I'm, not, oh, I'm not fluctuating the numbers here. I mean, really hundreds of people would gather every day to share in a time of prayer every single day. And so we were learning about that prayer time and we were learning about um, how that shaped all of who they were. And on one particular day, and we were always had these hosts of, of pastors there that were helping us and encouraging us and talking with us. On, on one morning, after a five o'clock morning prayer time, one of the pastors said this, you are the ones who taught us this. We're just doing what you, what we witnessed in you. And I'm going, I'm pretty sure I've never been up at five o'clock in the morning with a bunch of other Christians in the sanctuary praying in that way. You learned it from me. You're the one who taught us this. We're just doing what we witnessed in you. We get up early because the Bible teaches us that Jesus got up while it was still dark to pray you're the ones who gave us that book you're the ones who gave us the bible we're just doing what the bible teaches and you've taught us this lesson we're just doing what you instructed now i'm not going to start Suggesting that the first Sunday of Advent in a few weeks, a day that signals kind of new beginnings or new Christian liturgical year, that we're going to start this kind of gathering at five o'clock in the morning every single day. That would be impactful, yes. Different for us, yes. But the way they remember the saints 
And the way they tell their, that story certainly beckoned me to deepen my prayer life and beckoned me to give thanks to God for those who have gone before us. And so today we, we remember And we celebrate. We rejoice with those who have gone before us. We rejoice that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And so as we remember, we gather at the table and, and we, rec- we hear the story of Jesus. We hear about his life, death, and resurrection. We hear about how he was with the disciples and he broke bread and He poured out the wine and he instituted the Lord's Supper. We remember. We're called to remember. The liturgy invites us to hear, yes, the story of Jesus, but we're going to go even further back on this All Saints Day and we're going to hear stories or hear the names of heroes and heroines that were before Jesus. And they too were part of God's plan, of God's uh, will, of willingness to go where God was calling them to go. And so we remember their faithfulness. They're part of the ongoing story of God's call and God's deliverance, God's love and God's salvation story. We're going to hear the names of people like Abraham and Sarah and Ruth and David and, and Mary and, and Joseph. And recalling their names, we don't remember how perfect they were. Because they were not perfect. We remember how open they were. How open they were to be used by God and how God was able to work through them. Some ordinary and yes, unlikely people, accidental saints, if you will, so that God could do a rather extraordinary work among them. As we share in the liturgy of the great Thanksgiving, we'll pause and do some great remembering. We will remember the saints. We will remember the good company that we keep. We will remember the good company as a cloud of witnesses spans from the biblical names to the names of people from our very own congregation and our own families and friends. And so today, as we gather at table, it is cloudy as we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses And though such a time of remembrance may bring forth tears, and if it does, I invite you to let the tears flow. As we gather, our hearts are warmed. Our hearts are warmed in the remembrance. Our hearts are warmed as we offer prayers of thanksgiving for the many ways that those who've gone before us, the way they they touched our lives, for the ways they shared their faith, the way they impacted our faith. For in the remembering of the saints, we remember their stories. We remember their lives. We remember how they, they share the gospel with us and the ways that they lived. As we spend time with this great remembrance of the saints, We give thanks to God that those who lived in Christ and and died in Christ are, are raised with Christ to a life everlasting. In the Revelation passage this morning, there's this heavenly scene of great multitude of people of every nation standing before God and they're worshiping God. And today, as we break bread together, we join those in the heavenly realm, praising God for we hear with your people on earth. With your people on earth and all the company of heaven. All the company of heaven. We praise your name and and join their unending hymn. And so today we rejoice and we remember the saints who've gone before us, the saints who are with us yet even now. In our remembering, we recall how they offer the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, we're only here in church as people of faith because others have gone before us and they took it upon themselves to share the gospel message with us. 
For God so loves you and me that God sent his son Jesus so that we might not perish but have life everlasting. There's someone who knew that story, not just for themselves, but they knew the story was too good to be isolated, but it had to have been shared. And so they shared it with you and with me. Such love from God was in people like the Apostle Paul who, who took the gospel westward. Such love continued in the people like Martin Luther and, and John Wesley. Such love from God was lived out in the lives of missionaries to the Virginia colony. People like Joseph Pilmore and Francis Asbury. Others like Freeborn Gerritsen who would not get in the way of revival of those rowdy Methodist preachers who took the gospel and the presence of the Holy Spirit from place to place. Now it gets closer to home. Such love was lived out by grandparents, parents, spouses, children, Sunday school teachers, church leaders who served this church years ago, but whose impact on us is still here. Such love was lived out by people in the choir. Such love was filled by, lived out by people in the pews. Such love was filled out by people who were sharing in the youth room. Such love was shared when we went forth on mission trips. Such love is shared when we gather in small groups and we open up the scriptures and those scriptures define us, those scriptures empower us, those scriptures lets us know who we are as God's children. And so we are thankful for those who've who've shared that with us. And so yes, we are in good company, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And today we give thanks to God for the saints who've gone before us and are among us now, who've shaped our lives and cared enough to share the gospel message of Jesus' love for you. As we come to the altar today, may we find our place in this ongoing story of God's saving grace and ready to go out again, to take the gospel out into the world and to offer others what has been offered to us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.